My name is Lisa Guernsey. I'm the director of the Early Education Initiative at the New America Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to what is the fourth in a series of events that David Gray and I have been putting together here at the New America Foundation to focus on the importance of improving childcare and early learning for the sake of not just the children, but their parents, and for the full kind of family unit um, that we want to be making sure that we're thinking about when we talk about um, high quality, as, we'll, we will, as we will be today. So today's, today's title is Putting Quality First. And I wanted to spend a few minutes kind of setting the stage for why we thought that this was a really important um, piece to pull out and create an entire event around. As, as many of you all here know, the research on ch children's early years has been unequivocal on the point of quality. If infants, toddlers, and preschoolers are in high quality settings, they will be better off. One of the biggest and most recent studies was published a few years ago in the journal Child Development, based on a nationwide study that tracked children's progress into their teen years. This study showed that higher quality care predicted higher cognitive achievement at age five. In fact, the positive effects escalated at even higher levels of quality, with quality being measured in this particular study by professional observers who are watching how adults worked with the children in these settings. So given this knowledge, and that's just one of reams of studies out there that are showing us the importance of those interactions in children's early years, given this, and given what we know about the large achievement gaps that are currently affecting whole generations of children in our country, it's incredibly distressing to see how many families still do not have access to high quality options for early learning programs. And, and notice that thinking proactively, I prefer to call child care programs off at early learning programs, because essentially that's it's really what they are and can be. In the United States, about 90% of the cost of early learning is assumed by parents. Yes, subsidies exist, but for many families, they, if they qualify for vouchers or subsidized programs, the revenue collected by those programs doesn't go very far, allowing for little to no improvements in the quality of the staff or in the materials available to the children. Last month, the National Institute for Early Education Research showed that per pupil funding for pre-kindergarten programs has actually dropped since a decade ago. And several states are sliding backwards on benchmarks of quality. Earlier this year, NACRA reported that childcare based in providers' homes was especially weak, with weak training requirements, incomplete background checks, weak health and safety standards, and weak early learning standards. So how do we fix this? Can federal legislation help? I'm sure today we're going to be talking about CCDBG and ESEA, a Child Care and Development Block Grant, and the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. We certainly have a lot that we can be learning from the Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge that I'm, I'm sure will be a big part of the conversation today as well. But given the scarcity of funds and the looming possibility of even greater scarcity, depending on how budget negotiations shake out, could we be still putting more emphasis on channeling those scarce funds to high quality providers? What would that mean then for families that don't have access for whatever reason to those high quality providers? So how do we put quality first while also ensuring fairness? These are the very hard questions that our panelists will strive to answer. And before I turn the discussion over to them, let me raise one possibility that I believe should be part of this discussion. If good childcare is early learning, and we know it is, then the education world needs to be part of the solution in these earliest years. This means breaking down the divide between school districts who often think of children as only their responsibility after age five, and the child care and early learning community that bristles at the idea often of being subsumed into an education agenda. We need to get past those divides. Schools, districts, and state education offices need to be seen and to see themselves as partners in building better experiences for young children. 
Yes, school officials with funding are coping with funding shortfalls as well. Though some states, like those that have raised the top grants, may have some additional leverage and are doing perhaps better than others. But until high quality early learning is imagined as part of a child's education, not to mention imagined as an opportunity for parents to find daily care for their children while they enroll in job training or continue growing in their careers, then we will be missing an important ingredient in building stronger experiences for young children. So I do hope that the education piece will be part of the conversation today. So now it is my great pleasure to turn the podium over to David Gray, our Director of the Workforce and Family Program here at New America, who will moderate today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Thanks for everyone who's here today and those who are watching as we broadcast. And many thanks to the Annie Casey Foundation for their support and leadership on this important topic. I think Lisa said well the compelling case that there is for uh, the need for investments in quality uh, in child care and early learning and also the challenge relating to it. And fortunately, we have a distinguished group uh, of folks to help uh, talk this issue with us and um, to have some dialogue and your questions at the end. Their full and distinguished biographies are available outside, but <clears throat> let me just briefly introduce uh, Linda K. Smith, a Deputy uh, Assistant Secretary and Interdepartmental Liaison for Early Childhood Development at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, Rolf Grafwalner, who is Assistant State Superintendent for the Maryland Department of Education. Uh, and Kate Jordan Downs, who is Director of the Child Development Center of Easter Seals of Washington, uh, D.C. We are very fortunate, and many thanks that you have taken your time to be with us today. Thank you. We'll have your questions, as I mentioned at the end, and a good dialogue, but we're uh, pleased to begin with uh, Linda Smith. And will you please join me in welcoming her to the podium? Linda? Well, first I want to thank um, uh, Lisa and David and the New America Foundation for inviting me here today. This is, um, without, a, without um, doubt, my favorite subject in the whole world. Um, so the question was posed to me about how to best improve the quality of child care. So what I'm going to do first is run through sort of the status and link it to the recommendations that I will make. Um, those of you who know me know I like lists, so don't worry. By the end, I will give you my list of recommendations. Um, as we all know, more than 11 million children in this country under the age of five are in some form of nonparental child care every week. They, t they spend on average 36 hours in that care. Unlike most un, uh, other developed countries uh, that, we, that have experienced um, growth in terms of the number of working mothers, we still lack a universally accessible, comprehensive child care system that meets the needs of both children and working parents. Instead, we have a hodgepodge of formal and informal arrangements that parents cobble together and struggle to pay for. There are basically four kinds of child care in the United States, centers, family child care homes, relative care, and in-home care such as nannies. And I note that for purposes of my discussion today, I'm going to focus my remarks on child care centers and family child care homes. There are approximately 119,000 centers and 233,000 family child care homes. All of the states, in, and I stress this, all of the states have at least one category of child care that ex is exempt from regulation. There are 1.8 million paid employees working in child care and preschools. Nearly all are women, 97%. They are poorly paid. Average age, hourly wage is $10 an hour and that equates to $18,000 a year um, in, 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 in wages. Um, they are uh, basically poorly trained. Between 13 and 20 percent of child care employees have a degree, and 9 to 12 percent of family child care providers have a degree. The turnover rate is over 30 percent annually, and it is held there for many, many decades now. In 28 states, workers in centers do not need any training before going to work in a classroom. And in 17 states, family child care providers need no training before caring for children. Leadership is a problem. No state requires an early childhood education degree to run a child care center. 
and only one state requires a degree of any kind of that for that particular position. And I would note on that one that I think this is a critical issue that often gets overlooked because leadership sets the tone for programs. And over my entire career, I've never seen a program with a good leader uh, or a bad leader that has a good program because good teachers don't stay in those programs. So we really need to focus in on that leadership issue. Um, state child care standards, both for programs and the workforce, vary widely with minimal requirements for entry-level workers and many facilities exempt from licensing standards altogether. Oversight of child care programs is weak. For example, in California, it, they inspect their child care centers once every five years and family child care homes once every seven. We also allow up to 13 children in a home in South Dakota before a license is required. And I think to, to California's credit, I should note that they are working on this and they're giving a lot of thought to how they can restructure their licensing system. But that is really unacceptable that a child can get from birth to kindergarten without being in a program that has ever been looked at. The quality of childcare is mostly poor to mediocre with only 10% of child care in this country estimated to be of high quality. And I don't need to cite the brain research to this, this community, nor do I need to go on about the impact of high quality on children. The research is pretty clear on this. It's been consistent um, over time, and it continues to mount in quantity. So there's no question that we need to take this on. There's also no question that the single biggest indicator of high quality programs for children is the quality of adult-child interactions and that the workforce is key. What is yet to be accepted in this country, whether we like it or not, and I think Lisa alluded to this, is that child care is where most of our children are getting their early education, and there's no question about that. Child care in the United States is based on parent choice, a concept that no one disputes is a good thing. However, parents are seldom given the information they need to make a good decision. Licensing and inspection data is only readily available in half of the states, and only half of the states have a quality rating improvement system. Parents are frequently ill-informed and make assumptions about the quality of care they are selecting. 85% of parents think that most child care providers have had a background check. Most parents, 73%, think child care providers have had training prior to caring for children. Most parents, 76%, think that the government regularly inspects child care programs. And a majority of parents, 78%, think child care programs are required to be licensed. So we have a big disconnect in this country between what parents assume and the reality of what we have going on. In the name of parent choice and a market-based model of child care, we have assumed that more choice is better choice. Also in the name of parent choice, we have allowed the states to use public funds for care that is ex exempt from any quality or licensing requirements. All states exempt some, some child care, as I said. Despite low wages and low standards, the cost of care for parents is, is high, ranging from $4,500 a year to over $18,000 a year here in the District of Columbia. So to summarize, the quality of child care is low, the costs are high, there is poor oversight, and accountability for public funds is lacking. The workforce is generally poorly paid and poorly trained. And finally, there are lots of children and families that expect and deserve better from a nation as advanced as ours. So now to the question, how can we best improve the quality of child care, and is it even possible? I absolutely believe it's possible and that much can be done that is not necessarily expensive. What we, what we need is an, the national will to do it. I would say that there is no silver bullet, and more importantly, no single strategy, which I think over time we have looked for one solution after another. It's either the workforce or the inspections or this or that. And it is more complicated than that, and we're going to have to deal with the fact that a single strategy isn't going to get us there. So how do we do this? Number one. Make quality child care a national priority and stop the debate over quality versus access. 
putting poor children, or any children for that matter, in unsafe, unhealthy childcare is a national embarrassment and needs to stop. Adopt a federal definition of childcare. A person, or per, and this is one that came out of the race to the top guidance, and I think it, it is the one that we need to, to move forward with as a nation. A person or program that regularly cares for two or more unrelated children on a regular basis for a fee. How hard is that? Yet we as a country have still not defined child care, um, even for at the federal level. Develop, uh, oh, and, and by the way, that make the further make the, the recommendation that this definition should be used to guide the expenditure of all public funds, especially federal funds. Develop minimum program and facility standards for child care programs that align with Head Start and pre-K. These standards must become the baseline for quality rating improvement systems. Develop a monitoring framework that holds all child care programs accountable for basic health, fire, and safety and developmental programs, and I mean basic on that. Ensure that information on quality is available to parents freely and easily. Ensure that state early learning guidelines apply to child care. Make the workforce a priority by developing minimum training and education standards based on the knowledge and skills needed for the various age groups and settings. Ensure that all training is either CEU or credit bearing and leads to higher levels of credentialing and then education. It must be transferable from one location to another and, it, and I footnote that it must as a part of this workforce preparation, we must require comprehensive background checks of our workforce. Require early childhood education for all center directors, education and training specialists, and mentors. If we can't get education degrees for people in the classroom in child care, we need to start with the leadership uh, in the programs. Balance investments in quality of child care while expanding access. And I, when I mean that, I mean in terms of the block grant in particular that Lisa mentioned, that as we begin to add funding to the block grant, that we do that in increments in, in increasing the quality set aside incrementally to cover the costs of, of some of these uh, initiatives. And finally, increase and target investments in the infrastructure in low-income and economically disadvantaged neighborhoods where high-quality care is needed the most. And this in should include uh, support for family child care systems and networks in those communities. In summary, what is necessary is the national will to make change. This administration is committed to this change, the investments in Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge, the designation renewal system for the recompetition of Head Start programs, state advisory councils, and the proposed 2013 budget increases in the Child Care Development Block Grant demonstrates a serious commitment to quality. What is needed now is the recognition of the problem by all of those in this room and a belief that the quality of child care can be a national standard. And I think to accept anything less than quality as what we expect for our children is, is a national sh shame. It just is. So those are my remarks and recommendations, and I'd be happy to take people's questions and comments. So do we? We'll wait till the we get to the again? Yeah, we'll go through all three, and then we'll, okay. then we'll do a few. Okay. Linda, thank you very, very much. So um, down there. Yeah, maybe just go back down. Where you want. Sorry for a second. Ah, the screen is coming with us. Um, yeah, so we're, we're going to have uh, uh, Rolf and Kate will share thoughts, and then, and then we'll have an opportunity uh, for dialogue between and among us. It's so interesting to think, as, uh, building on, on uh, as Linda talks about the quality rating and, uh, and thinking about the interplay between the different levels of government, one thing we wanted to create today was an opportunity to hear from uh, federal, state, and local um, uh, practitioners, officials, um, folks with insight on how the various levels of programs uh, work together. And so uh, next I'd like to invite uh, Rolf uh, to come forward here and to, uh, to talk um, a bit uh, his experience in, in, uh, in Maryland. Um, we've got his bio outside, but, um, but we look forward to, to your remarks, uh, Rolf. And please join me in, um, in welcoming uh, Rolf uh, uh, Grafnaldner to the uh, podium, please. All right.
Oh, yeah. All right, you got this here? Yep. All right. The screen off. Um, well, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of it and squeezed between the federal and the local perspective. <laughs> and I think a lot is happening at the state level. In fact, uh, in Maryland, we have been at this for the last 12 years to make sure that uh, uh, early care and education really uh, is being improved uh, and that the quality is being addressed uh, primarily. Uh, I'm going to go over a few slides that I think will give you an, a sense of what we've been doing in Maryland, speak to the race to the top and weave in some of the comments that Linda made uh, because they were really uh, enticing and, and it's, it's, it's wonderful to have such strong leadership with the feds. Uh, this is Maryland. Uh, you're probably familiar with it. You drive through it or you <laughs> visit it occasionally uh, or live in it. Um, what's uh, very important for us when we look at the special population is the Hispanic uh, population has increased. Uh, when we looked at our reform efforts, um, in 2000 we had about 8% of um, um, our children being uh, Latino or uh, Spanish speakers. Um, the, uh, the other breakdown that's of course related to that is the fact that we have a lot of English language learners in our uh, program. That of course requires a somewhat different or an adjusted approach to address the needs of those children. This is something that I uh, you know, need to explain a little bit. Um, in 2001, we started to track the incoming kindergarteners' uh, skills and abilities uh, based um, on our early learning standards and on an assessment uh, which is, was a modified work sampling system. Uh, kindergarten teachers um, assess uh, children coming in after the first quarter of the year. The orange line indicates the score that indicates that those children have met full readiness skills, meaning the skills that in, uh, for successful engagement in kindergarten assessment, I mean kindergarten curriculum. The blue line indicates the group of children that have somewhat uneven skills and the green line are the children with some considerable deficiencies. Uh, the trend lines work uh, uh, in our favor and I wanted to start out with that because this is in line with some of the investments that have been made in Maryland to get to this point, and uh, I can also speak to some other aspects that account for this trend line. <clears throat> in fact, when we were uh, going through the uh, legislative process in establishing this reform effort in 2001, um, the legislators basically said, before we invest anything in early childhood education, we want to make sure we know how our children are doing over time and what kind of uh, progress we're making and so that really required for us to work on the outcomes and these are the inputs. Full day kindergarten, some of you may be familiar with that since 2007 in all elementary schools this was a 50 percent upgrade from 2003. This was part of a landmark school aid um, bill in Maryland called the Bridge to Excellence in Education which is, as we speak, issue of our legislature's special session to make sure that the funding be maintained for that kind of um, uh, effort. Part of that legislation uh, it was full-day kindergarten as part of the implementation and an expansion and entitlement of all four-year-olds with economically disadvantaged backgrounds to access our public school-based pre-kindergarten programs. Then we have licensed programs. All our programs are licensed in Maryland with the exception of our religiously based uh, programs that are exep ex exempted. But the nursery schools are licensed, our Head Start programs are licensed, the centers and family child care are licensed. Maryland Infants and Toddlers program, preschool for uh, es education, uh, we have about a nine to 10% of our young children uh, receiving uh, special ed services, early intervention services, we call them for that age group. And then we have a unique effort to um, have an uh, intergenerational or um, um, dual generational program available for uh, low-income families with infants and toddlers. And that's a basically 
an enhanced family uh, literacy program in 26 centers across the state. In the state, and when we especially I need to note that in 2005 the legislature moved all our uh, early care and education functions into the Department of Education, created a division that's the highest level uh, in, in the department for early uh, childhood development, and really with wanted to stress the focus on quality, wanted to make sure that the department is being not only uh, adopting an education mandate from birth to grade 12, but also uh, is involved in and engaged in improving the quality efforts. Um, program standards, we've had them for 10 years, that are part of early childhood accreditation. This is an effort to bring programs that are at this level to the high quality level that we would like to see them at. Uh, we have close to 1,000 programs over the last 10 years that went through this effort, including family child care and child care centers, Head Start programs, pre-kindergarten and kindergarten programs. Early learning standards. These are the standards that define what children should know and able to do at this young age. And of course, done in a developmentally appropriate uh, format, we link it up with the K-12 standards. And so that's something that's um, on the way, I mean, has been on the way for many years, but now we are changing it again to align to the common core standards. Uh, child care credentialing. This is an effort to bring the workforce up to certain levels of quality, I mean, qualifications, so they can meet what we want to see in programs, the diverse population they're serving and having the ability to differentiate early learning to the extent to support each and every child. Quality rating and improvement system. This is the big focus in our Race to the Top application, and we had a small version of this in place. Resource and referral. We also want to address the behavioral needs of children. Head Start collaboration. An early learning model with a heavy emphasis on professional development called the Maryland Model for School Readiness. Judy Center partnerships, where you have a Title I schools that collaborates and establishes formal relationship with all early childhood programs in uh, the attendance area of the Title I school. And we have 25 sites uh, with uh, impacting 40 Title I schools. And that's something that Linda mentioned, that we need to have an emphasis on getting to the programs in those low-income neighborhoods. And our venue or our approach for the last few years, of course, was the Title I schools because that's where children end up after five years of either being in a care program or in, um, in, in, uh, or at home. Maryland Longitudinal Data System uh, is tied in to really track our um, progress and then uh, s special efforts with uh, children with disabilities. I talked about the covenant structure. It is now the State Board of Education that oversees our early, early care and education programs in Maryland. Uh, we've uh, done a number of efforts to collaborate among all our agencies because the health, the family uh, support, and the education needs really come together at that level, more so than in K-12. to And um, uh, we've also uh, figured out a way in how we measure our access in a number of fronts. And so I just gave you some data over the last few years, progress on the accredited programs, uh, the measure of professional development and qualifications of our staff in the credentialing program. And uh, here's some more information, if you like, on our website. I wanted to mention just a few things that Linda brought up. I think from a federal perspective, it becomes very complicated to set standards, although it should probably be embraced and pursued. But a lot of it happens at the state level. In early care and education, the state level has really taken on some of the roles of um, efforts to improve the conditions, the early learning conditions of our young children. What's very important, and I agree with Linda on this, is the workforce, but that it is a, a comprehensive effort that uh, does not stop at workforce improvement, but also provides the supports for programs and for families so that the efforts that you put in in workforce development do not uh, resonate throughout the families, resonate throughout the programs. 
And I think that's uh, a very important aspect in improving the quality. The different strategies that, that I've seen and observed over the years across the country. There are efforts that relate to looking at a system and improving the system. Or there are efforts in the, in the country, in some states, that are starting from the center, from the hub of the relationship between those that care for children and the children, the quality of that relationship. Maryland chose the latter perspective. We're basically taking the relationship of uh, being providers and children and built the supports around it. And it starts with professional development, program improvement, continuous improvement, and then uh, improve some of the aspects on a regulatory level that relate to, um, the, uh, to early childhood education. And lastly, I want to say that our race to the top application, and we're very fortunate that we are part of nine states, uh, to uh, move in that direction and that we are joined with five other states, that we are now moving in the direction of addressing our school readiness gap that we have identified through our assessment in kindergarten. And the way we do this, because it's been a very chronic problem and very robust problem to crack. And so what we uh, intend to do is put the resources in, of our Race to the Top funds behind supporting programs in low-income neighborhoods where the children of high needs are mostly um, uh, enrolled or being, being served, and make sure that there's a strong collaboration with Title I schools that at the same time, through our Race to the Top, are being um, worked with and in turning them around and become high-quality schools our effort is to use the early childhood race to the top to work with early childhood programs in those areas so that the children have a chance of school success as they move into a public school setting. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. As the parent of small children in Maryland Early Development Centers, I'm very happy. We're in good hands here. My kids are in good hands. Um, the local perspective is very important as well, and, um, and Kate uh, Jordan Downs has both experience and, and passion uh, in this space, uh, and um, we're very pleased that she's here to, to talk about the local perspective um, in the District of Columbia and, and elsewhere. So please join me in welcoming uh, Kate to the podium. Kate? Good afternoon. Um, I'm Kate Jordan Downs. I am the director at the Easter Seals Child Development Center in, located in Columbia Heights. And we are a part of our regional affiliate, which is the greater Washington Baltimore region um, of Easter Seals, which is then part of a large national affiliate um, where the headquarters are located in Chicago. And we are also um, a member of the Early Care and Education Consortium. Uh, just, I guess from my perspective, I have to admit, uh, when I saw who was speaking on the panel, I was a bit intimidated as I was wondering why the heck they want me to stand up here and talk to you about anything. But as I got to listen to both Linda and Rolf speak and kind of hear the federal and the state perspective, it's very clear that a more finite local um, discussion about what's really happening in a center right now, I'm one of the 119,000 centers, and I consider myself one of the 10% quality programs out there. Um, I think it'll be beneficial to kind of tie everything together from a policy to a practical, um, reality-based, I guess, understanding of quality programming and early childhood education. I wanted to give you, I guess, a little bit of information about my center specifically so you know who I serve and uh, what, what the service lines are, and then talk a little bit about how I am able, with the support of many team members, to make it quality and successful and then at the end address still the challenges that exist despite efforts and um, times that we've, we've uh, run into some certain challenges, whether it's not only funding, but also a philosophy or a perspective on the importance of early uh, childhood education. So I apologize if I'm a, a little nervous up here, but um, I hope at least I can shed some light on, on what's happening locally. So first of all, we are located in Columbia Heights. We've been there since 1959, so we've been serving children um, for over 50 years. 
Um, we, our demographic, we have 88 children currently enrolled, and of that 88 children, about approximately 85% are receiving subsidized childcare vouchers. The other 15% are private pay parents. Uh, we also uh, have a very diverse ethnic uh, makeup of our, of our center. About 40% of our children, 35 to 40%, it fluctuates, are um, from Spanish-speaking homes, Latino backgrounds, which is very reflective of the community in which we're in. Uh, we also have about 30% African-American and then uh, a good 12% of multiracial families represented and about 10% of white. So it's, a, it's an interesting and very uh, colorful and exciting place to attend. Um, Socioeconomically, as I mentioned, we're diverse. And also, um, what's specific to Easter Seals and makes us unique is that we are an inclusive center. So 45% of the children that attend have some sort of special need. They receive some sort of therapeutic service. And that um, kind of plays in to line as far as best practices being representing an inclusive model and how that translates to quality education in a child development center as well. So that's a little bit about the center that I am at currently. Um, I wanted to take some time to talk about how we're making it work. What, what is happening right now that allows us to be successful with the current resources we have and the current state of the union, should we say. So first and foremost, and Linda touched on this and wanted to pull a couple things in that she said is our staff. That is the backbone and the heart of what we do. We um, have, I have 25 teachers, lead assistant teachers and floaters in my center, and as Linda mentioned, um, they are poorly paid and they are all women. Um, in addition, some of them, uh, I think Rolf was talking about the credentialing, some of them have bachelor's degrees, some of them have associate's degrees, most of them have a child development accreditation or a CDA, which is something that is a 90-hour course that a high school graduate can enroll in and then miraculously have a, have a job the next day without a ton of experience at a child development center. So um, I appreciated you kind of pointing that out, uh, Linda pointing that out, because it is so much to the heart of, of where some of the challenges come within a child development center and, and providing quality programming as the, the people who are interfacing with these children every day, the interactions that are happening and the training and education and experience that they have to make those positive, healthy interactions you know, what are we doing to foster that and, and who is currently in our centers right now? Um, my teachers love their children. They thirst for more knowledge. Um, we are able to use some local um, Office of the State Superintendent of Education, so I'm gonna say Aussie from now on because that's a mouthful. Um, that's our local DC government. They are able to, we are able to use um, some of their free trainings in order to uh, like broaden the scope of what our teachers are understanding as best practices or current um, strategies or theories that are coming out as far as early child education is concerned. And we also partner with TEACH, which is an organization that provides scholarships for um, uh, teachers within early childhood who would like to get an associate's degree or get a bachelor's degree. And they cover about 80% actually of their entire educational uh, costs and then the center and the professional split 10 and 10. So it's a good group effort and my teachers jump in that every time they can because they really do want to give the best and want to know more and want to be valued as a, as a professional within the world, this broad world of education, which I think Lisa made a good point in the beginning and how do we, how do we make this connection and value early childhood educators as much as we value public school educators or charter school educators? How do we bridge that gap? And, and let the rest of the world and the, or the nation even understand that what we're doing right now is the most important work in order for them to be successful in the future. So I'll talk about that a little more as far as the challenges go, but I thought that was a really interesting point. So one way we're successful right now is our fantastic set staff. The other way that we are able to be successful um, is we have to be, have creative financial solutions because there is not a ton of money uh, floating around to fund our teachers or fund our programs. And so what, what we have learned is that you have to tap into every opportunity and every program that you can that will serve and meet the needs of the children in your center. So for example, at my center, I have a very diversified revenue streamline. Um, we have, through Aussie, we have childcare subsidized vouchers, which is funded through the block grant. We have the DC pre-K incentive uh, program. 
We have the child adult, um, <laughs> child adult care food program, which is, allows us to be able to serve breakfast, lunch, and an afternoon snack to all of our children. So increasing their ability to receive good food or any food because a lot of our children do not have access to that on a regular basis. Um, we also have private donors, we have grants. We try to find every possible way to tap into revenue sources that will allow us to serve the most amount of children in of all abilities in the best possible way. And so I think that that's something that is a struggle for other, other places or other centers because we compartmentalize the type of children we serve. And I think by broadening our perspectives and who we're willing and welcoming into our centers and researching and learning a little more about the local opportunities, you're not only serving a more diverse group of children, but on a financial end, which is very important to the business side of what I do, you're also bringing in a little more money, which you're able to reinvest and then maybe pay your teachers a little more or buy that curriculum that you needed to offer good quality education. So every day I am thinking about new ways I can make money for my center, even if it's charging for parking spaces that I have in my beautiful parking lot on Gerard Street. Um, because it's just, it's not, it's, it's something that we realize we can meet the basic needs, but we don't wanna just meet their basic needs. We wanna provide quality above and beyond. And in order to do that, we have to come up with the money to fill that gap. We have to make the investment and figure out a way to fill, fill the gap that's missing between meeting the basic needs, which is covered by your subsidized vouchers and by your private pay, and moving into a higher quality program. And then finally, um, as far as just what we're doing to make it work currently, we use an inclusive mod, uh, model of childcare. And basically what that means is that our center accepts and uh, instructs children of all abilities. 45, as I said, 45% of our center is um, made up of children with special needs. In the early child education world, instead of an IEP, which is an individualized education plan, we have IFSPs, which is an individualized family service plan. <laughs> Excuse me. So if children come to us with one of those or a prescription from their doctor, we have therapists on site who are able to provide therapeutic services within our center um, in their natural environment, so in the classroom, on the playground. And the reason that this is important to quality is because when we talk about serving children, we're not talking about serving children who have just who are just typically developing. We're talking about serving all children. And a lot of times, in the best practices model, when children are segregated out and do not have exposures to other types of children from different backgrounds or different abilities or different socioeconomic statuses, it poses a struggle for them when they are put into an integrated environment in the future. So what is fantastic when you walk into my center is that you get a slice of life from every perspective and the children have no idea what the difference is. They are completely um, loving, absorbent to all new ideas and creativity, which instills a sense of self-esteem, um, confidence, so that when they do leave, um, not only are they educationally prepared, but they're socially and emotionally prepared and able to enter into a school system and be more successful had they not had an opportunity to, to be in a center such as Easter Seals. Um, what goes along with that is also investing in a curriculum that is something that you take, you know, we use creative curriculum. It's one of, one of the many curriculums out there for early childhood education. And the reason that's important is because we need to be intentional with what we're doing in the classroom with these children. We're not just there to babysit them and hope that they make it through the day back to their parents. We are there to teach them. And the divide that happens in many of the four areas that you spoke with, so centers, family care, um, home, and I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the other one. Thank you. Uh, we're the, centers are typically the only one that you, utilizes a curriculum, which is why you might see statistically that when you, they take the test that um, they do in Maryland, they come out higher, children come out higher or more prepared if they've left a center-based environment. So it is, uh, for us, what's you know key is not only having an inclusive best practices model that we follow, but investing in a curriculum that will allow us to diversify lesson plans so that it's not just helping Johnny over here, but it's helping Jenny over there, and you have everybody meeting their same goals and developmental milestones in a way that is specific to their learning needs and specific to their abilities. So 
that is my, my nutshell of, of how we're making it work with what we have right now. As far as challenges that we're facing in order to become higher quality, because we don't want to be stagnant. It's great to hear that you're doing a good job and you know, your kids are leaving and they're successful and to get all those pats on the backs. However, we have to continue to grow as the industry changes, as education standards change. We have to be able to step up and meet those needs and prepare the children. And I will echo very much um, what Linda said as far as the staffing, um, the staffing going with poorly, poorly paid and undereducated uh, teachers. It's not because they want to be undereducated. I just, I, I, I guess I want to make that clear because I think there is a misconception of the early childhood education field. And most of the women who I work with, I would say almost all of the women I work with, want to be valued, want to be looked at as a, a valued member of the educational community. Not the woman who taught your kid the colors, but someone who fostered their development in a positive and appropriate way that allowed them to succeed in the future. And I think that goes along very much with um, the idea of it needs to be a national will to change. We need to, we have not, not only to change, but to start viewing what what I do, what these women do on a day-to-day -day basis, what therapists do as important, as a valued piece of a child's development. Um, we kind of skip to kindergarten sometimes in our brains when we think about education and who are really the professionals and the teachers. And I think when that shift happens, when those, whether it's the funds that open up or the perspective that changes first or the educational background that changes first, when that shift happens, you will see the turnover rate go down. You will see the education go up because people will be compensated fairly. They will be respected um, as professionals in a, in a way that a teacher, a second grade teacher or a 12th grade history teacher is respected. And I think it's a very, very important uh, point, I guess, or challenge is just re recruiting and retaining really quality staff who will stay with you after they get that degree and who won't leave you for the public schools because they get paid more. Um, the, other, the other challenge is that we're not able to reach all families, meaning I am able to serve children through my subsidized vouchers system who are very low income. And I am able to serve children who come from families that are very wealthy. But the people in the middle do not have access to my program. Um, for, I'll give you just a couple brief examples of like the financials. Um, for a family of three in Washington, D.C., the most, the absolute most a family of three can make to qualify for the voucher is $47,000. That could be one mom and two kids. That could be a mom and a dad and one kid, however you slice it. $47,000 is the most money someone can make to qualify for, for a voucher. On the flip side, my private pay rate for an infant room is $1,550 a month, which is $18,000 a year. My toddler room is $1,350 a month, which is $16,000 a year. So think about what you guys make in this room. Maybe some of you are welcome to come on in and be my private pay parents if you like. <laughs> but think about that gap and who, who really can't access that care. Um, that's, that's one of our, our biggest challenges as far as making sure that we really can reach everybody. Um, and then finally, that there just are not a lot of, of centers that are willing to make the investment like, they are, like we are or do not have the resources to make the investment like Easter Seals is able to. And um, within that, I think, you'd, you know, Linda, I'm, I'm sorry to keep going back to you, but it's so interesting to me that all of, a lot of the recommendations you made are on, on my list. And to be in such different kind of scopes and worlds but have the exact same perspective on what the challenges are is comforting because it's it's not like nobody knows this at the top. <laughs> so that's a, it's a comforting feeling. Um, but you talked about the pre-K standards being integrated throughout, like for infant and toddler rooms, making sure that we use those same models and standards for our babies just like we use them for our three-year-olds. That is a huge challenge as well. And un unfortunately, uh, all of those recommendations and challenges come back to financial support. Um, so. I hope I didn't talk too long. Um, I, I appreciate the time to just be able to express my passion. I, I apologize for my jitters, but I get very excited about having a chance to really talk about what's going on in the real world and to let you know that the women and men who are in our field really do love and care for, for the children who are out there and want to be the best they can be, but we need support in order to do that.
So thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah. I'll invite all three of our panelists to come and, and uh, prepare for questions here and just to take a seat if they, if they would with many thanks and a, a, a real sense uh, of how the, the, the levels of interaction go together. And yes, as, as Kate mentioned, um, the consistency of some of the recommendations. We're going to go into to questions here. Do we have a, a New America mic uh, somewhere yet that will that'll go around here? Well, great. Okay. Right. I'm going to ask the first question. What we're going to do is we're going to pair up questions. And as we get to the, I'll give some, maybe some, some uh, share some thoughts in just a second on how we might do that. But I'll ask the first two questions. Um, so feel free to, for anyone to answer uh, either one of these. The first is on the quality rating improvement system, um, how it's going, uh, any thought on the future of it? What are the challenges uh, of it? And just, just thinking about the future of the quality rating system. And then secondly, the Child Care and Development Block Grant, as we know, is being reauthorized, um, or at least there's a lot of discussions on it. It's always being reauthorized, but it's at least discussions on it. Uh, in the Senate, not so much in the House. But if there's a single thing that would improve quality if we were to reauthorize uh, CCDBG, what would it be? Um, and you could either take column A and say we're assuming a resource constrained environment and maybe what would improve it most is the quality set aside increase or some more licensing or background checks um, or something that would be inserted to improve the, the training of the workforce. Or you might reject the premise that this has got to be a quality con or a resource constrained discussion and take column B and say, you know, it's, if we're going to do CCDBG, there's got to be $5 billion more, there's got to be a significant increase of, of resources. So. My two questions are the future of the quality rating system or if there's a single thing that improves quality in the federal uh, legislation, from your perspective, what would it be? So any one of you or all three of you want to tackle either of those questions? First hand, first hit want to hit the buzzer gets to go first. So Linda, <laughs> you're ready to roll. Okay. Well, I would like to talk about um, both of those, actually, right. and I think that the first one is the quality rating improvement system. And, and I think, you know, what we're learning from Race to the Top is going to go a long ways to helping the rest of the country move mm -hmm. forward with quality rating improvement systems. But one of the things I want to caution people about, too, and it was my, one of my closing remarks, is that there isn't a single strategy that's going to improve things in this country, and that, I think, includes quality rating improvement systems. They are one piece of a, of a really complex situation, and I think um, one of the things, and we're looking at this in the 2013 budget proposal that we put in, which is how do we begin to give people, and, and like we were, we're talking about the workforce, the ability to move within the, the rating system. And we can build the infrastructure, but if we don't have the support for the people in that infrastructure, we will have created a house of cards. So we're really interested in, in the 2013 budget, ensuring that we have support for programs and providers to move up. And I think, again, it gets back to no single strategy, you know, is going to, is, is really going to work. And I'll let the other one, people take a shot at that before I go on. All right. Any thoughts on quality rating? Rolf? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think this is a, um, um, a good approach in general. What, what I've been proposing in the number of venues I had a chance to talk about is 37 states have put in a plan for the Early Learning Challenge grant. They did it because they, I think, had an intent to improve their system, <coughs> not just because there was money out there. In fact, those states, many of the states that did not receive funds are moving ahead. I think that's a platform to work from and uh, strive to have Department of Ed and HHS or ACF programs align with that, with respect to the CCDBG, with respect to Head Start, with respect to any other early learning programs that might be funded under um, uh, Department of Education. That's a wonderful platform, and that means taking into account the comprehensive nature of what the criteria were for the Early Learning Challenge Fund. You looked at workforce development, you looked at uh, program improvement and the quality of programs, you looked at standards, you looked at data systems, and you looked at ways in how you can improve your outreach to families and engage families to a greater extent. So there is a, a wonderful opportunity, I would think, with the CCDBG to have that tied in, made, make it part of the planning process, and use the add-on quality piece that you had in mind, Linda, maybe as a way to 
support on a 50 state level some of the planning and some of the implementation of what they had in their plan originally. So there's, I think there was real interest and I think it was a breakthrough for the field. Um, so that my comment. Well, Kate, do you have anything on either of those questions you want to? Um, I think for the quality rating system, my understanding for, for DC is that it's a tiered system. Um, it's three tiers, bronze, silver, and gold. Uh, Easter Seals went through that process about eight years ago, um, moving from a bronze to a gold <coughs> tier. And I, my understanding is that uh, the, it hinges on accreditation. So we chose to get accredited through NACI. And that process is time consuming, intense, and expensive. So I guess my only recommendation as far as how, how the grant could assist with the quality would be you know, making available some funds to centers who do want to take that next step, who do want to get accredited, especially smaller centers who don't, you know, being at Easter Seals, I am very fortunate to have the support of a regional center, a regional agency, but there are several centers that are, you know, very good centers in the city, but don't have that financial or fiscal support behind them. And so how do you want them to get better if we don't make these funds uh, available to them, whether it's money to just pay for the registration fee or to get a consultant to help them understand what changes in their policies need to be made in order to become accredited. So I guess for the quality piece, that would that's my perspective. Um, as far as the, the grant in general, um, in DC, our, our rates, we get, we receive daily rates for our subsidized vouchers. And I've been at Easter Seals for five years. In the five years that I've been there, those rates have not not increased at all. Uh, of course, our expenses have increased. So um, I think that in one, you know, if there could be more more money available to increase the rates so that it can be reinvested into whether it's teacher strat um, teacher salaries or any, any <coughs> quality um, program voids that are missing, that would be fantastic. Thanks. Yeah. Very good. Before we open it up for full questions, Linda, did you want to say something about uh, reauthorization? Yeah, I actually do because I think things and I was sort of interested and wanted to actually ask Rolf to tag on to this um, because he he said something in his remarks about you know your, Maryland and your legislature wanted to understand you know sort of where you were and what what the status of and what you're going to get for the money essentially is what legislatures are asking and I think that same thing is true of Congress right now and I don't think one of the things that I think we all need to be aware of um, in CCDBG reauthorization is, is that there needs to be and we need ideas for how we become more accountable for the money that we get. I, do, I think I keep saying to people, I don't think we're going to get more more to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. We have got to start showing results, changes, and improvements. And so I think that there will be more accountability built into CCDBG, and that is is not necessarily a negative thing. It's time to to take a look at that. How do we count? movement towards quality in this country, and I think that that's where um, we're going to have to focus some time. Mm. Rolf, did you, she, she, yeah, uh, absolutely. she set I, you I, up there. Do you want, do you want to say anything yeah, about it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that's exactly what happened in our case, and I think Congress uh, on a bipartisan level will probably, because we had that same issue. We had Republicans and the Democrats really standing behind it, although we have a majority of Democrats in our House and Senate. But we had a lot of strong Republican support for the notion that we invest more if we know what we're getting for the money. I mean, it's a simple idea and it has worked. And um, I think, you know, it's going to be more complicated working with 50 states, but we had 24 local school districts. And that was complicated. So um, probably a way. It's fascinating. I mean, I think they're really, it's a, it'll be a very interesting bipartisan, I mean, I'm kidding about they're always reauthorizing CC, but at some point we're, you know, they're going to get close, and particularly in the Senate, and um, the issue of accountability really has some traction, I think. You just mentioned the bipartisan effort in, in Maryland as a model broadly for a national um, federal legislation reauthorization. All right, so let's open it up for broader questions. We've got the, the mic in the back. We'll start from the back then, because that's just happened to be where the mic is. As Claire comes forward, we're going to do two questions and let our, our we're going to, uh, pile them and let our, our um, panel respond to them as they like. 
as you ask your question, um, just identify yourself if you would and, and ask a single question um, uh, until we, we go, uh, go through the line, okay? Any, any questions as we, uh, raise your hand if you got a question. All right, let's just start coming, Bowen. We'll go, go two at a time and then we'll, after two questions, we'll have our, our panel respond, okay? Dave Oxter, a Disability Consortium, and uh, this is a question for Kate about those 45% yes. of the children with special needs. In uh, the federal legislation, they have an individual uh, family service plan, and I was wondering how that plays out with your kids and whether it makes a difference in outcomes. Okay, so let's hold that question for Kate, and then a second question is, Claire, as you come forward, Claire, just um, the lady right here. I'm from the Administration on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. And um, I appreciated what Kate said about an inclusive environment in preschool and uh, early care and education. I'm wondering if the other panelists can comment on plans, uh, expectations to include children with disabilities in quality child care in the future as well. All right, great. Thank you very much. So let's start with Kate and, and the 45% the I, IFSP question, and then we'll, we'll see if either Rolf or Linda wants to, to talk about the inclusion um, question. Okay, okay. Kate? Um, so just to make sure I, I understand the question, you're, you're, you're asking what um, effect the taking children and working with children who have IFSPs has had on their outcomes within our center? Okay. What, Okay, sure. So um, our children who come to us with IFSPs have usually gone through the Infants and Toddlers with Disabilities, um, um, I'm sorry, department in, in DC. And they come to us, for those of you who are not in the disability world at all, um, this plan is something f that is outlined for children and families and the ca any caregiver, whether it's um, grandma, the teacher, or a therapist, what their goals are in order to reach certain developmental levels, so where their weaknesses are and what we need to do to support them and help them meet those developmental milestones. What that looks like in my center is when a child comes in with an IFSP, we take a, a not a, an inclusive approach from our adults, so our therapists, our administrators, and um, the teachers as well as the parents all kind of discuss what what we're going to be doing in the classroom to support the goals that are outlined in the plan. Um, I guess in comparison to where they become, they, where they end up outcome wise, I can say with full confidence that our children who come to us and receive therapeutic services in their natural environment are far and above where they would be had they received it outside of uh, a center or away from their peers. For first, first of all, having access to not only childcare, so their parents can go to work and make a living, but that they don't have to race their child all over the city to go to several different places to get their therapies, and that they're able to receive it in a natural environment with their peers, who are also little therapists themselves, sets them up to be successful and oftentimes discharged from therapy services altogether. Um, now, does every child meet those outcomes and become discharged? Certainly not, because there are certain um, genetic disorders or disabilities that will never be a hundred, you know, you will always need some sort of therapy for. Uh, but compared to the outcomes and how we measure that, we use our curriculum and we use um, a few developmental assessments. We use the ages and stages questionnaire and we also use the MCHAT in order to kind of do um, gradual six month uh, assessments as to their progress and what we need to focus on in order to get them on level with their typically developing peers or to get them to the level that they are um, cognitively or developmentally able to reach. Mm -hmm. Does that answer? Thank you. Good. Okay. Great. Yeah, Marilyn, just at the time when the transfer took place, there was a big effort to make sure that uh, children with disabilities have access to child care services. Uh, that was a problem that uh, we, we've been addressing over the years. It becomes our standard uh, policy that children with disability have access and the supports available. What uh, grew out of a special USDOE program, an extended option for IFSP for three, I mean, four and five-year-olds, is something that Maryland uh, implemented as the only state in the country. That is an opportunity to have least restrictive environments for children with disability, no matter where they are. Mm -hmm. It's sort of the situation that Kate was explaining at the local level. That is, to can have a child in a child care center with disabilities and have the speech therapist come to that center. 
have the funding available or have the therapy services available at the center or at the family child care home, wherever that child is and whatever setting has been determined. And that's been a huge effort. Unfortunately, we've got defunded and now we're sort of extending it with, uh, through the race to the top with a number of uh, jurisdictions. Inclusion is a big effort because early intervention and early education are sewn at the hip. They are basically uh, this, the, the, the same aspect of supporting children. And early intervention isn't just reserved for children with disabilities, with unidentified disabilities. Early intervention goes further in addressing the needs, especially with some of the kids, too, that have behavioral needs, is being addressed. So um, I think the spectrum there is, is uh, broad and wide. Uh, the capacity for programs to address the needs really depends in some instances on the disability, but we have special funds available for, for that purpose. Well, I would take a little bit different, um, I guess, approach to, the, to this answer, and I think um, one of the things that I'd go back to is the points I made on the training and preparation of the workforce, and one of the things that my experience has shown me over time is that um, child care people are ill-prepared um, to take care of children with special needs and in many cases are afraid of them mm -hmm. because they don't know what to do. So I think we need to get back to the issues around how do we train and prepare the workforce to take care of children so that we can write laws until, you know, the sun do goes down and we still won't get there. Um, until we get make the workforce comfortable with it because I think what we see happening is any excuse will do in terms of you know the reasons why we can't take them and so I think we need to look again at the workforce and the training mm -hmm. you sure um, you just made me think uh, I totally agree that teachers are often very intimidated by the idea of being responsible for caring for a child who has special needs specifically if they're medically fragile or they have they're not a child who can function without a lot of support in the classroom. Um, what I have found to be the most successful component to getting past that barrier is that the leadership of that organization or the director, for, for example, me, happens ha is, is on board 100% and is there to support them. Because you can have a degree in special education, you can have a nursing degree for, for all intents and purposes. However, each child is so different and their experiences in the classroom are so di different that all of us who are in the disabilities field and working with children um, who have disabilities learn so much more through our experiences. And it's just being willing to take that first step with that first child and realize that it's not quite as intense as we have in our mind. The, the stereotypes or the concerns that we have are, are valid at times, but not something that should debilitate us from serving serving those children. So I think that there certainly needs to be um, a commitment from the leadership of whatever center it is, because if you there, if I'm not committed, no one else is going to care or be committed. And when if I act scared or afraid, um, that's that's the message that all of my teachers are going to have. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very good. All right, let's keep coming down the line here. We've got a question here and a question in the front. My name is Kimberly Cook, and I work with School Readiness Consulting. Mm -hmm. This year, we're doing a universal evaluation of the pre-K classrooms in DC, looking at teacher interactions and also child outcomes using progress monitoring. Um, I live in Virginia, and I've also worked on education issues in Maryland. And I'm just intrigued by the disparate opportunities we have here in the DC metro area for our little ones. Um, and I wonder, what will it take for more states to integrate early childhood education in their K-12 curriculum, beyond just rhetoric, but in action? Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. That's a good question. All right, and the lady in the front. My name is Lee Young. I live in Montgomery County, Maryland. And previously, uh, I submitted some material for the Education Secretary, Nancy. She's no longer with us, but yeah. Yeah, but she, she received a award. Mm -hmm. my, my real concern is whether it's in the child care or in the family setting, got to be an educational, loving, nourishing environment. Mm -hmm. The problem now is that whether it's in the education department or in a department of social services, they abuse of their power or what they call mental facilities or adult protective services. They take away the care of, of their parents or grandparents. So that is automatically affect the children or 
kids' uh, and emotional, and besides their resources, they take away. And they divide us parents or grandparents to the mental hospital, and they cost so, a lot. Yeah. And so there will be a lot of burden for the family. So I wonder if you can address this type of issues, make the uh, uh, government effort really on this, uh, this type of, of situation so government resources will be used in the right way rather than the wrong way. Very good. Okay. So we've got the two questions, the integration question here, uh, uh, and, and, and then um, help, help in the particular example that uh, Yun raises. Mm -hmm. Either of those two questions strike you as ones that uh, that be something you could contribute to, Linda? Yeah. Well, I I do think that there's there are serious questions that you raise about the disparities between the states, um, and I wanted to and it jogged my memory in terms of one of the things that Rolf said, and and if you noticed in my remarks, I did when I said we need standards, I didn't say federal, <laughs> and I you know I've been around a long time, and I don't think that we're going to get federal standards in certain areas. I think that that is just off the table. But one of the things that I do think that we need is for states like we have here to come together and begin, I think we need to begin the process of states agreeing on basic standards, but that needs to come from the states as opposed to coming from the federal. And I think maybe there will be more um, palatability to states like, you know, some that, le that drag their feet on this if they par are participating in the development and the, and the process. And it's just a thought. I bet I've been giving this a lot of thought because we do need those minimum standards, as I said, for um, child care and for the workforce. Uh, and I just am not sure we're ever going to get those kind. The program standards are what I think we're not going to get. I think we can get the other ones. And and I'd be interested in people's thoughts on that. But mm -hmm. um, and I think you know, Rolf, you alluded to that um, that that in his remarks, and I think he's he's right on on that. I remember in 2004 or three, um, the, f the, a, the Office of Child Care made it a, a requirement for states to develop early learning standards um, and in return for receiving the uh, CCDF, what we call Child Care Development Fund. Um, I found this to be a bold move, and I think it was the right one. The states really were moving in that direction because at that time, the states were very disparate on this issue as to whether to establish any states, I mean, any standards. And that really did bring in a sector within our state that had not thought of standards before. That was our child care community. And that was really, uh, I think, an effort. So I think there are some tools, administrative tools, if you will, that may uh, get, get us in that direction. And it's great to to you know, uh, have minimum standards and some other means to address um, uh, the issue of um, uh, setting state quality standards across the states. The shifting of government resources, if I understand your question correctly, is that there is a part of money that's reserved, if you see, for children and families, and that there's been a major shift, if I understand it correctly, into a particular area within programs um, supporting programs, supporting the quality of programs, and other resources that may be needed for families um, are uh, under-resourced. Do you get this right? Question? Yeah. Let's, yeah let's I mean, hold, I'm not sure yeah, if I, yeah. yeah. Let's, so let's dialogue for it afterwards for just a second mm -hmm. here. Do you, have, do you, do you have anything to say on the, on the integration piece? Okay. Uh, we'll come back to this piece in a second. Any other questions as we, as we go down the line here for a second? All right, let's get a clarification. Clarify the question, would you? Yeah, my question is that in the government agencies, whether that's I mean, in the government agencies, they abuse of Department of Education or Department of Health and Human Service or even law enforcement. They abuse of their power. They arrest the people or their parents or grandparents and they divide them or send them to the mental hospital. So that means they have to charge to the parents or grandparents their resources or maybe government Medicare resources. So instead of um, abuse or those who waste and abuse, why don't we just say eliminate those abuse and really focus on the 
environment of the children or youngsters' educational nourishing environment. Mm. Oh, definitely agree with that approach. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. It's a good. It's a good mm -hmm. comment here. Mm -hmm. I see a question in the front here, Lisa. Would you? Um, <coughs> was wondering if we might be able to take a moment to push on what I thought was one of the really compelling comments. Actually, all three of you, in a way, have touched on it. But um, Kate, when you were talking about the middle not having access, yeah. I, I think that that's a really key point that, that we need to um, really grapple with here. Because I think when we have Head Start, and we, and, and we certainly are pulling up on the, the child care quality piece through, whether it's the quality improvement systems and some of the new standards that are coming into place, we're still not helping those families who are making $50,000 a year, who may have two yeah. young kids and who can't, there's no way they can afford even you know, $10,000 a year, let alone 18,000 for their children. Mm -hmm. So how do we make sure that those families are not, um, real, their only options high, you know, very, very low quality program? How do we help them find high quality? And I, 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 I don't think it's going to be an easy one to answer, obviously, but I'm wondering where all three of you, you fit in terms of some solutions on that. Yeah, that's good. Let's hold that question here. Any other hands go up here? Let's take a question over here. Uh, I'm Connie McKenna. I'm with the American Federation of Teachers. And, of course, we're very focused on the workforce aspect of quality. Um, and I was interested to hear in D.C. that the NACI accreditation process is the avenue to um, QRIS, and, and that it is a very difficult process. Do you think, um, specifically looking at that, but just more generally looking at actual financial resources for building the workforce, as we get more accustomed to quality um, standards, are you seeing, especially in this difficult economic time, any awareness um, in our legislative bodies that, that it really is about the money and about the focus of money on workforce, along with all the sort of more abstract standards that people love to discuss and point to, but actually will not connect to the people who do the work. Is there any kind of a, a shift? Um, or are we really under the burden of a bad economy? That's interesting. All right, well, we're going to go down the line here and just we'll conclude. So we'll start with Kate and conclude with Linda for the last word for our panel today. Lifting up Lisa's question around, right, the middle, if you make too much to afford a voucher, um, but it's super expensive, what do you do? Very good question here in terms of, of resources. I, I keep thinking about the quality, you know, what should the quality set aside number be and at what, how, how, what progress should we attempt to make as it relates to to resources that uh, need to be put aside specifically for quality. But in, in dealing with the two questions or just concluding comments, Kate, why don't you start, Rolf, and then, and then Linda. This is a very interesting question because it really does come up every so often when you start talking about what difference does it make for a school teacher to go through a four-year degree program, go through a certification to be qualified to work in a school. That includes pre-kindergarten in, in our state. Um, versus somebody who is not investing that much into post-secondary education and the state or the federal government through funding stepping in to compensate for that difference. For instance, TEACH is a scholarship program. We have a scholarship program with 19 institutions of higher education in Maryland. We have a couple hundred people going through that system. In the regulatory framework of a, a school in, uh, system, uh, you wouldn't have that investment at the state or at the federal level because it's done by those that want to qualify for teaching. In early childhood education, you have a different workforce, and there, so the state and the federal government step in to compensate for that. So then the question is, can we switch and do it through a regula regulatory change? Mm -hmm. Can we make it a requirement for all of our teachers in child care programs to have at least an AA degree in early childhood education? Well, the implications would be huge because you would start to, but because you're dealing with a market-driven system, you suddenly drive your programs out of the market for the constituencies or for the customers they serve 
to a great extent. And it isn't programs like Kate's. Kate's probably will survive in an environment like that, but not programs that are with have 60 children enrolled, uh, operate on a shoestring budget. Uh, it's going to take them out of business. Then you have the number of children that would need the care or families are looking for care. So then you have a situation where children may not have access to programs anymore that are licensed because they might be out of business. And then you get into the situation where you have, yes, you have high standards on workforce. You got uh, far less programs that you have to license now, but you got this huge, you know, unlicensed market of care that's going to take over. And so it, it, it would be interesting to really look at what, uh, you know, how you can calibrate it and make it work. But I think the scaffolding of QRIS might get us to the point where you can look at some of the economic impact of a regulatory system that requires higher qualifications for folks to start in childcare. I like it. The scaffolding of QRIS. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go with that. Oh, it's just, uh, I like it. Uh, Kate? Um, I guess to, to go off what Rolf just mentioned as far as teacher credentialing, um, two things. One, just for everyone's awareness, um, with NACI, uh, which is our, accredit our accreditation that helps us reach gold tier and improve our quality, uh, the current standard for certifications of, of teachers in early childhood education, 75% uh, of my lead teachers are required to have an associate's degree or be enrolled in a program, and 50% of my assistant teachers are required to have the child development accreditation. However, in 2014, that is going to 100% for both lead and assistant teachers, and it's not in process anymore, it is completed. So those regulations are set for, for NACI, and at least in, from my local perspective for DC. Um, what we're doing to get there is using TEACH to help my, you know, our current employees access um, monies in order to get these degrees so they don't lose their jobs because come 2014, whatever the, the date is, mm -hmm. they will not be employed with Easter Seals anymore because they do not meet, meet the requirements. So that is kind of in, in motion. Um, as far as the financial question you asked, I have no idea because I don't get that high up, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ah. um, <laughs> ah. But um, what Lisa had mentioned, um, and which I, I, I feel pretty passionately about as well because I fall within it, is this echo of what we all already know within our political climate right now is what, what's happening to the middle class. Um, and I guess my recommendation or my, my heartfelt hope is that that dis disparity of service to that group of people, which is really the majority of, of who in the country, um, will be recognized, A, and that some sort of, I guess maybe, f I don't know, f I hate to always go back to finance, but it, it's really what it comes down to, some sort of financial opportunities will become available to not subsidize and give them free childcare, but to have some sort of scholarship program or have some sort of fund where you can um, maybe charge them 75% of what, or 50% or of what is usually expected so that they do have access, access to, to what's available out there. I don't know the answer to that question because I can't find that program to serve those people. I would love, love to do it. Um, but that's, yeah, it's definitely something that, that weighs heavy on us because I've had to turn people away right. because of right. it. Right, so. rubber meets the road there. Yeah. All right, the last word, Linda. Okay, just one. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, those are two big subjects, and I can't yeah. I can't do that in one. Um, you know, I was I wanted to respond to your you know sort of your um, reference to the quality set aside, and I think that we do have some models in this country that we should look at in terms of what the quality set aside ultimately needs to be. And I think we've we've seen the the progress of Head Start over the years, going from you know you know increasing the quality set aside in Head Start and how much of that was used, and also the military's use of their funds. And I think we have lessons to be learned from that, and I wish I had an hour to give right. a little <laughs> lecture on that. Um, but I do think that one of the things that on the quality set aside is that we, we have got to, and it gets to the questions about um, financing, and I think what we have to figure out um, is in a market-based system that Rolf talked about, 
what is the appropriate mix of funds to go into the demand side, which is essentially the vouchers in this country, and, and the supply side, which is the quality. And I don't think we've really figured out how much the quality side of this is going to cost us in a way that gets to your point of um, making it the, the, the services accessible and available to middle-income families. And I think that's where we still struggle in this country. Um, I think if in order to make this work, we do have to look at these models. And we've got to figure out um, what is the cost not just what are we right and what do we have right now, but what is the real cost to produce the services by age of child and setting? Because I think until we know what it costs, it's hard to understand what, what share belongs to whom and how do we begin to build a system that parents can have access at all income levels, not just the lowest income. And we don't know that yet. And I think we're beginning to, to get an understanding that that's where we need to go with this. Um, it's, we're not there, and it's going to take some more time. And why do I say that? Because it is tied up in the cost of care is tied up in the, in the, in the personnel and the staff. We all know that. That's, that's the cost driver. And, and I think what we still have yet to figure out, and this is you know, my, from my experience again with the Defense Department model, is what is the right mix of training and education to get the job done? And I alluded to that in my remarks, because we really need to understand the knowledge and skills it takes to do the job. And does it take a degree to, to, do, to provide infant care? Yes or no. And, and, and I think what we, we've got to, to struggle with here is once we know the skills and abilities, then how do we get the training and how much does that cost? Then we know when we go to Congress or anywhere else asking for funding what we're asking for. And I think we're not there yet. And I know this is getting awfully deep, but I do think about this an awful lot. <laughs> um, so, so then that's number one. What does it cost? And then how do we get the money into the programs? Because I think that is also a piece. We've learned some from the TEACH model and the wages model and other models, but you, I heard you saying you piece it together. Mm -hmm. And you're constantly, constantly trying to do that and stay one step ahead of keeping enough money to pay your staff. So we've got to figure out how to get the money into these programs in a way that stabilizes the staff and allows her to keep paying higher wages and not worry that tomorrow the voucher's gone and therefore I can't pay the staff anymore. So I think it's that combination of what does it cost? Then what's the fair share between the public and private responsibility? And then how do we get the money into the programs in a way that gets us where we want to go? So I think we've got a ways to go. I think there are people working on the financing issues right now. And we are getting closer. And I think we're getting closer because we recognize that we have to do that hard work now. Um, so I think that is there. Um, you know, in answer to the question, whoever asked that you asked the question about any change in the mood in Washington, I do, e e despite the um, all of the struggles this, with the economy and the budget here in Washington, I will tell you that you know our guidance from our leadership was that any, and the reason we got the 300 million in the budget for 200, 2013 was is any funding that we had in excess in our discretionary funds was to go to quality. So I think that is a real change in terms of the leadership, the mindset. We want to get something done caveating that by saying that we need to measure it. We need to be able to know what that money is buying us. So I do see a change in, in Washington in this, on, around this issue and lots and lots and lots of questions around it. I think what we've got to do, as I said before, and I'm beating this, this drum again, is that we've got to go to Congress, to our legislatures, with real proposals where we're accountable for the funds that we're asking for. And it, and again, more of the same is just not going to work, and it's not going to work here in Washington. A pragmatic but very hopeful way to end. I like it. <laughs> Will you please join me uh, in giving thanks, join Lisa and May in giving thanks uh, to Kate and Rolf and Linda. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.
And uh, thanks to the Casey Foundation, all of you for being here and for watching.